Welcome to today's Museums from Your Home live stream presented by the University of Alabama Museums. My name is Rebecca Johnson and I am the Communication Specialist for UA Museums. And with me today is Lindsay Gordon, the Education Outreach Coordinator at Mountville Archaeological Park. And Lindsay, I see we have a guest with us today. Would you like to introduce her? Yeah, happy Mountville Monday, everybody. Um, I hope everybody's had a good, safe weekend. Today we have Miss Stacy Hathorne, who's like one of my favorite people and I consider her a mentor. Um, and, um, she is the state archaeologist and she works with the Alabama, Alabama Historical Commission. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And uh, before we get started, just want to remind everybody that we are live so that if you do have any questions for Stacy or Lindsay, uh, feel free to drop them in the comment section and we'll get to them. And uh, this is live, so anything can happen. So just hang in there with us in case we have any connection issues. Hopefully that won't be the case. Uh, but just wanted to remind everybody that this is live. Uh, so, Lindsay, how should we get started today? So let's start from the beginning. So, Miss Stacy, how did you start in archaeology? How did you get your start? And then how did you become the state archaeologist? Um, so I grew up interested in archaeology, like I'm sure you did, and um, other people that went into archaeology. My parents took me around to different state parks when I was a kid, and I just decided I wanted to be an archaeologist. And um, I have to give a shout out to Larry Bean, who is the archaeologist up at Russell Cave, because he was the first person who actually told me that, hey, you can do this for a career. You can make a living. And a lot of women do this. So um, Larry was the first person that sort of uh, made me realize that my dreams could become a reality. But of course, you have to go to school for you know at least six years in college, get your master's degree to be a professional archaeologist and, and of course the ones who teach in universities go on and get PhDs. So I got both of my degrees from Auburn. Um, I worked with the museum expedition program there at uh, the University of Alabama during my time as a student so that was a big influence on me as well. Um, my first job out of grad school was with the Alabama Historical Commission. I came in um, reviewing section 106 reports which I guess we can talk about when we talk about what the Historical Commission does. And then I just worked my way up. I became an um, archaeologist senior and then ultimately the state archaeologist. I've been here for 20 years. Oh, awesome. So you mentioned the Alabama Histor Historical Commission, because that's where you work. So tell us a little bit about that. I think um, we have a lovely picture of you in PowerPoint. So <laughs> tell us a little bit about the Alabama Historical Commission. All right. Well, we're the um, uh, we're the agency in the state that um, our job is to see to historic places, and what we do is we protect, interpret, and preserve Alabama's historic places. Um, and there's a lot. There's there's two divisions in the agency, and there, we have a lot of jobs to do in terms of preservation. But you know, people often ask, well, what's the difference between the historical commission and archives and there's a lot of difference but it, it kind of breaks down to generally their historic things and where historic places we're about historic sites so we have a historic sites division in which we um, we own and maintain historic sites in the state that belong to the state and the people of Alabama and we also have a um, historic preservation division in which we do programs that are both federally and, and state generated to uh, help preservation statewide with people with private property and things like that. That's cool. Cause, um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of your historic sites? I see the, some of them listed here. All right. Well, we, um, I know there's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we, have state, we have the state capitol. Um, which is actually on the National Register. We have Belmont Mansion in Tuscumbia in Colbert County. Uh, we have Confederate Memorial Park in Marbury. We have Fenda Hall in Eufaula. We have Fort Mims Historic Site, which is an archeological site that's in Tinsaw in Baldwin County. We have um, Fort Morgan, the Fort Morgan site in Baldwin County, which was also the, 18, the site of the 1812 Fort Boyer. Um, we have Fort Toulouse, Fort Jackson Park in Wetumpka. We have, it was also an archeological park. Mm -hmm. We have um, Gaines Wood Mansion in Demopolis in Marengo County. And we have the Freedom Rides Museum right here in Montgomery. 
um, Magnolia Grove in Greensboro, the Middle Bay Lighthouse in the middle of Mobile Bay, mm -hmm. <laughs> Old Cahaba Archaeological Park in Orville, which was the first state capital, and Pond Spring, uh, the General Joe Wheeler home in Hillsboro. And if you haven't visited any of these sites yet, I don't know if all of them are open, but when things get better, you should go visit. They're, they're all... And I didn't mention Bottle Creek, which is... Um, there are tours there. It, it's still in its natural state, so it's not really managed like some of our other parks. But okay. You, it, it's a mound site, like Moundville, mm -hmm. but it's uh, in the middle of the Tensaw Delta, and you need to take a boat tour to go out there. Awesome. And this is not the best time of year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so with your historic preservation division, I know there's a lot of different regulations and things. <laughs> Um, that we have to go by. Can you talk about some of the state programs and the federal programs that you guys have? Well, we do the National Register of Historic Places. Of course, um, you know, what we do is we take nominations and we have a review board that looks at the nominations and then those are sent on to the National Park Service to either be accepted or denied. And we have the Certified Local Government Grants and Program where um, part of the Federal Preservation Fund is supposed to go to local governments for preservation. And so local governments can go through a certification process and the, where they'll be eligible for these grants to dis, do historic preservation in their local community. We do federal tax credits for historic preservation and we do Section 106, which I mentioned before, and that's how I really got started here. And um, there's more about it later in the PowerPoint. But um, it's basically the, a law that says your tax money shouldn't go to destroy your heritage. And there's a whole review process to consider projects that could, um, could negatively affect historic properties. Uh, our state programs, we have the cemetery register and cemetery permits. The cemetery register is a very popular program. We have underwater archaeology permits. Um, and we have the Alabama register, which is a kind of like the National Register. It's more of an honorary, it's, it's a good test run if somebody's wanting to nominate something to the National Register to go to the State Register first. Uh, we have the State Tax Credits for Historic Preservation, and we have a Historic Marker Program that has to do with sites that are on the National Register. Cool. Yeah, I think how we started working together was the Cemetery Register <laughs> Permits. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so. It was, yeah. Oh. So who all Gosh. works with, oh, sorry, say that one more time. No, I just was just thinking back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, but Stacy has known me since I was a young tater tot of an archaeologist. <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit more about who works in historic preservation. So what kinds of people do you interact with? Well, obviously archaeologists. And at the top of the list, it says SHPO, which is State Historic Preservation Officer. And the Alabama Historical Commission is the State Historic Preservation Office, in addition to being the, um, to being the Historical Commission. So we have that sort of federal function uh, in association with the National Historic Preservation Act. So we have a State Has Historic Preservation Officer. We have a Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer. Um, we have architects, architect historians, we have city planners, archaeologists, of course, um, curators, uh, site managers, people in marketing, people in finance. Uh, you know, there, there's all kinds of, of uh, uh, there's a place for a lot of different types of careers in historic preservation. Oh, I see down here there's a decorative arts professional. Tell us what a decorative art professional might do in historic preservation, because I think that's well, super cool. Uh, they, might, they might help um, restore interiors of historic homes. So, um, but, you know, then there's also public outreach. So somebody who, who does some um, decorative arts might have some involvement in that or historic reenactments. Mm -hmm. so. That's cool. So what does the state archaeologist do? <laughs> so what do you do? <laughs> okay. I definitely never get bored in this job. Um, but uh, let's see. For uh, of 
course, I, I've talked a little bit about the legal part. You know, we I give advice to, to federal agencies and state agencies regarding preservation and preservation law. And then I give advice to people on the state laws, chiefly the Alabama Burial Act when it affects archaeology and um, the Alabama Underwater Cultural Resources Act, which I mentioned early when I talked about maritime archaeology permits. Um, cool. Yeah, we... Um... So you mentioned Section 106 here, and I, can you talk a little bit about Section 106 and what it means? Well, like I said, it's, it's, um, it's generally a law that says your tax money shouldn't go to destroy your heritage. But of course, um, the application of that law can get pretty um, complicated. So what happens is when a federal agency has what's called an undertaking, they have to consider whether that undertaking is going to negatively affect our heritage and that could be historic buildings or archaeological sites or historic landscapes a lot of different things so the state historic preservation office is the local expert for this federal law so the state historic preservation offices review these projects to see if that if there's a potential for them to affect say in my job archaeological sites or my staff's job and so we would review these projects and we would say you need to do an archaeological survey then we review those archaeological surveys for um their their state guidelines that those surveys have to meet so we make sure that those meet those guidelines and then um, if they have to go all the way through to what we call mitigation where you do an actual archaeological excavation we look at the research design and um we also try to make sure that the project comes out with some sort of public um, product at the end because you're looking at a law that says the people's tax money shouldn't go to destroy the heritage but if the people never learn what we learn you know archaeology is important for the information that it contains mm -hmm. but that information never gets to the public then we really haven't fulfilled the spirit of that law yes oh so uh, you talked a little just now talked a little bit about um the process of section 106 um I guess where you start to identify those possible sites. Can you tell us a little if you have any more to add about um, the process? Well, that's what the slide is. Is um, you know that the federal agency is ultimately the the one that has to make a reasonable effort, and we just advise the federal agency in that process. Um, so they they also have to consult with Native American tribes who have an interest in the area. Awesome. So what is um, the SHPO's role? So I think, is it, I think uh, we probably got the cart before the horse. Yeah. Um, <laughs> our role is, is advisory. We advise, we act as the local experts and we advise the federal agency on the historic resources. Gotcha. And we also oversee the guidelines and make sure that the work meets standards, you know, just like anything. If you're going to build a house, you have standards. If, you're going to do an archaeological project. You want to make sure that it's sufficient to identify any sites that were there. So we make sure that the that the work that's done meets those standards. Awesome. So yes, I think you talked about this too. Like there's a review process. Yeah. Um. That's that's a lot of projects. New projects to review. Two thousand. <laughs> um. In during... access. And you know some some things that come in are like. A cell tower plot, you know, it's less than an acre and we look at it one time and that's it. But then there are other projects like highway projects that go mm -hmm. on for literally a decade. So when we count in that number, something's counted one time. It's not counted, you know, the 20 or so times that we review it or big pipeline project or something. So. Right. But still, that's a lot. You guys do a lot of work. A lot of great work. It is. I have an awesome <laughs> So um, um, we talked a little bit earlier about the Alabama Underwater Cultural, like the act. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what it says? Well, it was, it was in response to the Abandoned Shipwrecks Act when um, the states took responsibility for um, submerged archaeological sites in state waters. And so basically what Alabama did is what other states did at this time, and it it is just an act that helps us to protect and manage the
the archaeological sites that are in Alabama waters. And um, I think there may be another slide about what is Alabama waters. Um, yep. <laughs> yeah. So it's basically the navigable waterways. Um, if it's in an impoundment, it's the run of the river within that impoundment. Um, and then, of course, the, the Tensaw Delta and the Mobile Bay and the Gulf out to the three mile limit. But if there's any doubt, there's a number conservation, the Department, Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who, who manage the state waters and the state lands. So if there's any any question as to what's a navigable waterway, <laughs> they're the ones who can answer that question. Yeah, I see the number here and I'll repeat it out for anybody that might need it. But the number to the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources is 334 242-3484. So um, let's talk about archeological sites. Um, you have a picture here of an obvious archeological site. Um, yeah, that's an underwater archeological site. It's a trash ooh. dump and it's pretty obvious that that's an archeological site. Right. There are lots of artifacts together and you can recognize them as artifacts. Um, Alabama water well, land in Alabama has a lot of vegetation mm -hmm. and the water has zero visibility in most of the state. Mm -hmm. So it's not always obvious and easy to, to picture as, you know, it's not as easy to tell as this right here. Right. This is an obvious logical site. But, you know, when in doubt, you can contact this office. You can contact your local archaeologist. I know Malville gets a lot of calls about mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah, I didn't even realize it was underwater. That's cool. <laughs> It's not Alabama. We wouldn't have that kind of visibility. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's talk about um, isolated finds. Um, uh, someone said they heard a rumor that the HC allowed isolated finds. So um, I guess we're going to talk about archaeological sites and um, right. What an is isolated an isolated find? find? Artifact that's not associated with an archaeological site. So um, you know. Archaeology, as I said before, archaeological sites, and, and it, it, you've been doing this every week, so your viewers probably already know that archaeology is important for the story that it can tell, for the information. An isolated find can't usually tell that kind of story. You know, it's, it's the context of an archaeological site and all of those objects together with archaeological features and eco facts and, you know, all the science that we do that tells the story. So mostly what we're concerned with at the Alabama Historical Commission is interpreting those stories or preserving them so they can be told in the future. Uh, an isolated find is not necessarily going to tell that story. But of course, if, when in doubt, then, you know, call somebody, don't take it. Right. Yeah. Like leave it and let somebody know locally to you. Right. Or a right. local archaeologist. Um, and then, you're, you're... I just put that slide on there because, you know, people say, oh, well, there's just one cannon. I mean, well, cannons, you know, don't aren't isolated finds and, you know, they're types of things that people didn't just lose their cannon, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I left yeah. that there. <laughs> yeah, those, yeah. Those things are going to be part of a, of a more important story. So what does the State Office of Archaeology do? Um, well, I think we did that before, didn't we? Um, yeah. So we're, we, we monitor, um, this, this is still under my big heading of different things I do. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we've gonna, we, we monitor underwater excavation permits in Alabama water. So if somebody wants to salvage a ship or they want to do archaeology on a ship in state waters they need a permit through our office to do that and then of course we monitor that permit well before we get to talking about the cemetery stuff can you tell us a little bit which i've been interested in um in like clotilda and its project can you tell us a little bit about that because i think it well i guess as you know and and a lot of people know um we uh we ultimately, we, we had a little false alarm of, for um, 
someone uh, recognized the site, which turned out not to be the Clotilda. But the really, when we were when we went down to investigate that site, it turned out that um, we saw other shipwrecks in the vicinity, and we realized that this was an archaeological, a maritime archaeological district. And we also did core samples, and those core samples showed that that part of the river had never been dredged. And so, as I was talking about early about context in archaeology, we realized that this part of the river had context, and it was able to tell its story better because it had context. And we decided to do a, a remote sensing survey of that entire stretch of river. So we, when we did, we investigated each of the anomalies that were above the ground, above the, the bottom, you know, the, the shipwrecks that were sticking up above the bottom. And one of them ultimately turned out to be the Clotilda. Or we cannot rule it out as Clotilda. As <laughs> um, and for people who don't know what the Clotilda is, can you tell them? Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, you're it's, um, the Clotilda is the, was the last slave ship to come to the U.S., uh, it was a, it was years after it was illegal to bring slaves. It was slavery was still legal, but it was illegal to bring slaves from Africa here. And uh, some men made a bet that they could go to Africa and bring people here. So they um, they outfitted this Clotilda, this ship, this fast uh, Gulf Coast schooner. They went across to Benin, and they bought captives from uh, from war and kidnapping, and they brought them back here. And they were enslaved for a, just a few years before the Civil War, when they were released. And a few made it back to Africa Town. Of course, they wanted to go back home, but um, they they banded together as a community and they built Africa Town, which still exists today. And uh, many of the descendants are still around, and I find it incredibly amazing. I mean, the story of their their courage and their tenacity and um, their triumph over adversity is just, it's an inspiring story that everybody in the nation deserves to know about. Yes, I agree. Um, so another thing that you do is you work with the cemetery program of can you tell us a little bit about the Burial Act, Alabama Burial Act, and things of that nature? The Alabama Burial Act um, protects all human burials in Alabama, including um, Native American burials. So, and, and, it's, and it, this is on private property. This is the only law that we have that extends onto private property. It's a felony to dig somebody up, um, anybody, on your private property or anywhere else. But this law also goes ahead and it protects anything that's in the grave with the person. It, it protects the monuments to that, those people. And that can be, of course, you know, the obvious headstone. It could be a mound, like in Moundville, you have funerary mounds. Mm -hmm. um, it could be a stone cairn or it could be plants. You know, sometimes people planted cedar trees or even daffodils on graves. And so those plants are protected as well because they're part of, um, of that cemetery landscape and part of the memorial to the dead. Yeah, you mentioned that. I think, well, I, think I highlighted it, it. For a while, Native prehistoric Native Americans were not included, but, um, but the law was changed to include everybody. That's great. And it is a class C felony, so <laughs> it <don't>. is. <laughs> it is. Now, there's a permit process to mm -hmm. move grave, um, and you can go through it. You can do it legally, but it involves notification of uh, descendants and, um, of course, archaeology that meets standards. Cool. And we patriot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So um, this also one thing looks, I mentioned, oh. but we kind of hit on that this that that we do is we do our own projects. Mm -hmm. So we we any kind of construction that would go on on AHC sites, we would look at to make sure it's not going to affect archaeology on those sites. And, you know, some of the sites we have are just archaeological sites, but other sites are sort of a mixture of a built in like Fort Mims is just an archaeological site. Mm -hmm. But you know, most of our other properties have 
buildings as well. So like you can't run a new electrical line to the building without the potential to affect archaeology. So we do we do that kind of thing, but we do our own projects, as you know, <laughs> because you worked <laughs> with the Plaza. Uh, we for years worked on the state house, which we have ident- eventually identified, and we're now building a ghost structure to represent. And then, of course, you mentioned before the Clotilda project, where we have managed that project from the beginning. So. Yep. Shout out to Miss Linda Derry at Old Cahaba. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. And okay. Jonathan. Eric Bipes and Will Lowe, who did the lion's share of the archaeology. Yes. Tell them I said hello, too. <laughs> I will. Um, and so then, of course, we do outreach and education, which is your daily work. Um, and that's a, a picture of me dressed funny at Fort Toulouse Frontier Days on one side and the other side. We, um, years ago, before the Clotilda was discovered, we put national about 10 years ago, we put Africa Town on the National Register. And that was a, um, the picture on the right was a public outreach day that we did there in the cemetery while they were doing um, remote sensing. Cool. Um, you talked about um, Bottle Creek earlier. Um, I did. A little bit. Um, that, about the fact that you guys manage that site as well. So this, these are just well, photos of the site? Well, that's the, that's a photo on the left, and then, mm-hmm. as you can see, it's in its natural state. It's not developed like Malmo, mm-hmm. so it's more, I suppose, adventure tourism. Yeah. It, February is the best time of the year to visit because there are fewer yellow flies and uh, water moccasins. <laughs> yeah. But um, and that that's a picture of a tour going up the largest mound there, and then there's a map of the site. The site's covered in palmettos, so you know you can. If you're if you're out there without a, an archaeologist as a tour guide, you don't really um, see the some of the mounds because you just it's kind of a slight rise in the palmettos. You can see the big one, and there's a few more that that are visible, but um, it's better with a tour. <laughs> and it's also on your mound trail. Yes, it is. Um. So you also manage the archaeology lab. Yes, the, the Alabama Historical Commission um, Archaeological Repository for all of our sites is at Fort Toulouse in Wetumpka. Mm-hmm. And so um, I manage that as well. We only keep collections for our own sites, though. So we don't take collections from outside. That's, that's like, yeah, I think. A lot of people, well, I know we've had a thing on Erskine Ramsey. Um, we've talked about Erskine Ramsey before. That's a curation repository that we actually, the University of actually, Alabama actually has. That's housed at Moundville. Um, yes, and- ours is much smaller. <laughs> <laughs> but we still, we're still held to the same standards you are. Yeah. Um, so uh, anyway, so I managed the archeolo- archaeological lab and um, then the next slide is just sort of the other things that nobody really wants to know about you know, <laughs> personnel, you know, consultations, paperwork, 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 those kinds of all the paperwork. <laughs> like it's different every day, you know. Somebody may call me and tell me that they found a site that I need to come see, or um, may have to do meetings. There's, there's no telling. So here is Miss Stacy's contact information. Um, so you can contact her via email, and her telephone is here. Um, is there anything else you want us to know about your wonderful job <laughs> <laughs> or the historical commission? Uh, I think I think we covered it. I mean, we're. Uh... We serve the people of Alabama, and it's our job. We're the stewards of, of the historical, historic resources for the state of Alabama. So, you know, we're easy to find. We have a website. Um, our phone number is on the website. So if you need us, call us, or if you're just interested, call us. Um, and once things start um, getting back up and running, they also have a number of great um, programs as well. Um and events like Olkahaba has a really cool, uh, 
I don't know why I just blanked on it. Ghost tours in October. Oh. And then Fort Toulouse has their frontier days. That's really wonderful. So um, we, we do. Yeah. We have a, all of the historic sites. So it's cool. some, and, there, and there's a calendar on our website of the events. And, and there's some virtual content, not, not to the degree that you're doing with every Monday, but uh, there's, we, we have recently did a, um, a live session at Freedom Runs Museum that was oh, very cool. So since it is, oh, yes, Miss Rebecca. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we did have a question about volunteer opportunities. So uh, Ronald says we have volunteered with the AHC for over 40 years. Some sites do have volunteers. If anyone is interested in a particular site, we are to check and see what opportunities are available. So uh, Stacy, do you have any thoughts on, uh, and, uh, about volunteerism and how people can get involved? Well, we do. And if, if we have an excavation going like uh, we did at Cahaba recently, we always try to take volunteers and uh, incorporate that into the, the program. Uh, and so I would just say, you know, keep notice on our website. And uh, right now, everything's sort of shut down and virtual because of COVID-19. So we, we don't have any of those opportunities ongoing at the moment. But, you know, we'll be back and we will in the future. And I also would say, you know, we, we, of course, you know, we're a state agency. We have opportunities. You know, you're a, a state institution. You have opportunities. But there's a, the Alabama Archaeological Society mm -hmm. is a group that um, if somebody's really interested in volunteering, they can join. And there are also a lot of opportunities through that group. So, you know, you can reach other archaeologists in the state that don't work for Mount Blair, the Historical Commission. And you might have an opportunity to participate in something that is going on there. I know that um, Bonnie Gums down in Mobile does a lot. Uh, and so does um, recently Harry Holstein did some stuff up in Jacksonville. So it, it, if you're really interested in archaeology, I would, I would encourage you to join the Archaeological Society. Um, there's two meetings of the year where people talk about the work that they've done. And uh, I hope those are going to be able to go forward. But um, anyway, it's a good group. There are lots. There are lots of opportunities. Archaeology is something that a lot of people find interesting, and uh, you know we like to share that with people. And I just had a personal question. Uh, so we talked a lot about archaeology and and how uh, we try to preserve some things and get information about the past. So I, I was curious, Stacy. It seems like to be the state archaeologist, you would want to enjoy history, you, that you would be uh, uh, someone who loves studying history. So I was curious, um, have you always been somebody who enjoyed history and learning about the past? Or is that something that you sort of had to uh, come into it? Oh, always, since I was a little kid. I mean, um, you know, a lot of it was visiting historic sites with my parents on vacation. Um, and, and they fed that interest. They bought me books and um, you know, they were interested in themselves, but there's also family histories and a sense of connection through my family that I think has a, um, has an effect, you know, going back to decoration days and learning family stories and being shown somebody's headstone and told, you know, that person's life story, you know, you make those connections really early on that um, these stories are important and they're, they're part of what makes us who we are. And, um, they really belong to everybody. Yeah. Agreed. So since today is our lovely Moundville Monday, can you tell us about the first time you visited Moundville? Well, now that would be when I was a, when I was a kid. When I was, <laughs> uh, was probably in the 70s, I would guess. But I remember going there with my parents and going to the museum, which was very different back then. Um, and just being utterly fascinated with archaeology. I mean, Moundville was, of course, one of the sites that influenced me to be interested in archaeology. Uh, Moundville and Mesa Verde and, uh, and Williamsburg and Jamestown. I was very fortunate. Um, I don't want to give the impression that we were wealthy. We had, a, we had a compact car with a little tent and a cooler in the back, but we managed to go and see all these historic sites when I was a kid. And I think that may be one of the things that really influenced me to want to be not only in archaeology, but in the preservation side of archaeology. 
because those things were important to me as a kid. And, and my uncle was a big one. And then later, as a student, I became involved in the uh, in museum expedition program. And some of the um, programs that Betsy Irwin was there at the time mm -hmm. that, that, that she would have, I would come on the weekends and, and we would do uh, programs also. So Mountville was a big part, I suppose, of my influence in archaeology over the years. Well, awesome. Um, Rebecca, did you have any more questions or comments? You're muted. Uh -huh. <laughs> Every now, and usually I'm pretty good with all of this, but every now and then I catch myself being <laughs> muted. Uh, <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, well, you mentioned uh, Museum Expeditions. So what was it about Museum Expedition that um, encouraged you to want to go into the field of archaeology? Well, I was already an archaeology student by the time I experienced the expedition, but I had worked on an, another one from another college before, and I just, um, I was so thrilled to find the museum expedition program here in Alabama and how well organized and how educational it was. I, um, I still think it's one of the best things I've ever participated in. I mean, it's, you know, people, children and their parents and teachers, they can come and they can participate in real science. And um, that's an amazing opportunity. And, you know, it was, it was an opportunity to share the thing I loved with other people. So, um, yeah, I'm a big fan of the expedition program. I hope it, it keeps going and going. But, um, yeah, so, you know, it also teaches people that there's important science in their backyard. Because one of the questions I get, like, people, like, well, what do you do? Well, I'm the state archaeologist. Oh, do you work in the Holy Land? I'm like, well, maybe if you're a Creek Indian. Um, but no, I'm the state archaeologist. I work in Alabama, you know. We're the largest watershed east of the Mississippi River. People have lived here for thousands and thousands of years. And, you know, it's a great place. We think it's a great place to live. People thought it was a great place to live in the South. So there's a lot of incredible archaeology. There's a lot of incredible geology, you know, any kind of, um, we have, an, you know, an incredible bomb. So, you know, any kind of science that you want to be involved in, there's, there's opportunity to study it here in Alabama. And I think Museum Expedition really brings that home and, and demonstrates that. Yeah, I was so bummed. Uh, I'm bummed about COVID-19 for so many reasons. Uh, but one of them is because uh, this would have been my first chance to go and um, see what Museum Expedition was like this year. And uh, I didn't get a chance to do that. So maybe next year. But, um, but yeah, Museum Expedition sounds like a great opportunity if you're interested in those kinds of things. Uh, we do have a question. Uh, uh, Stacy, could you speak to the procedures for having historical markers placed? Well, that's a little bit out of my bailiwick. Oh, okay. um, and, and there's several there's several marker programs. Um, the ones at the Historical Commission are just for sites that are already listed on the register. And Hannah Garman is the person who handles that, so somebody should call our office and talk to Hannah. Markers that are not listed on the register, I think that's at Archives and History. It's through the Alabama uh, Historical Association. All right. Lindsay, did you have uh, anything else? I don't think so. Okay. I'm trying to think of more questions. <laughs> well, well I, did, I have so many questions about history, uh, but uh, I don't know if uh, if you can, because since you're with the Alabama Historical Commission, I don't I don't want you to like have to be on the spot to like pick favorites or anything like that. But <laughs> but I'm always trying to learn about the state of Alabama. I uh, grew up in Alabama, but then I moved to Georgia for 14 years and then have come back recently. So um, so I'm always trying to rediscover uh, Alabama now that I've moved back. So uh, are there any places historically that you think are um, other in addition to Moundville, of course, <laughs> uh, that are um, worthy sites to, to go and visit in terms of history and um, places that people should check out? Well, of course, all of our historic sites that I mentioned earlier um, and, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, there's there's a lot of little. You have your mound trail that people can follow and go see the the different mounds that are open to the public. You know, there there are local museums and things. I mean, something something just dismal. Canyons is amazing. That's a little private 
uh, place and it, not really historical, but in a way it is because it's a relic, uh, uh, it's a relic forest that was from a time before ours. So I do consider that, you know, I, I go there and I think, wow, this is what it was like when the Indians first came here rather than how it looks now. So, um, wow, you know, and the, there's other state parks that are not under our banner, like uh, St. Stephen's. Mm -hmm. And the historic ironworks sites. So Alabama has an has an amazing history that goes from, uh, you know, Russell Cave all the way up until the industrial period and the rise of steel. And uh, there are stories involved in all of those sites. And you know, it's kind of it's kind of hard to encompass them all in one conversation. But yeah, it looks it's like a. Bill's mentioning Cane Creek, um, so yeah. that might be another place to go check out. Yeah, I'm, I'm finding that there are places that I didn't go to when I was growing up here, so I need to go and, <laughs> and uh, discover them myself. Um, well, Lindsay, uh, if, uh, if you don't have anything else, I guess we could wrap it up here. I, I think I'm fresh out of questions. Um, oh. But see... Uh, but Stacy, if you want to uh, just, uh, if there's anything that you want to leave our audience with about uh, the historical commission or history or archaeology, uh, what would you say to somebody? Oh, wow. <laughs> I know it's kind of a big question. <laughs> well, I mean, history belongs to all of us. It's important to preserve it and respect it. And, uh, you know, and there's opportunities to do that. So just contact us if you're interested in you'd like to have some of those opportunities. Great. Well, I guess we could uh, go ahead and wrap this live stream up. Uh, so I think that's going to do it for this Museums from Your Home live stream. Um, we have decreased our Museums from Your Home live streams down to two days a, a week uh, right now in July uh, because we've got a big event going on called Bama Bug Fest. Uh, so if you're interested, you can go to BamaBugFest.org. That's happening on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays until July 25th. Uh, so there'd be a lot of uh, buggy content, some some fun stuff. We're trying to incorporate uh, superheroes and comic books with uh, uh, with spiders and water bugs. And we also have some things going on with the Tuscaloosa Public Library as well. So uh, if you want to check out any of that programming, you can go to BamaBugFest.org. Highly recommend it. I've been learning a lot about spiders uh, and, <laughs> and things like that. Try to be more, uh, you know, pro bug. Uh, try, uh, try to be a little uh, friendlier to those things because I've learned, I've learned, I don't know about anybody else, but I've learned if you know things about something, you're not as maybe afraid of it. So, <laughs> so I'm trying to, trying to become, excellent. yeah, trying to become more bug friendly here these days. Uh, let's see, on Wednesday, we'll be live streaming from the Gorgas House Museums and the Mildred Westervelt Warner Transportation Museum's Facebook pages. Uh, if you're interested in history, we talk about history on Wednesday. And uh, if you would like to support UA Museums and everything that we do, uh, you can go to give.ua.edu slash museums and become a supporting member of UA Museums. That's a great way to do that. Um, and let's see what else we got. Uh, if you want to check out more of museums from your home, uh, we do have a website for that, museums.ua.edu slash museums from your home. You'll find out uh, about everything that we've been doing since March. Uh, we've, uh, we've been doing this um, during the pandemic. So if you want to check out some of our past live streams more, but we have lots of archaeology uh, live streams. We have uh, programming on the Alabama Indigenous Mound Trail that Stacy mentioned. So you can go check that out. Uh, let's see if I've missed anything. Lindsay, have I missed anything? Uh, we do have a YouTube channel. Uh, yes. Get to all of our plugs. If you want to keep up with all of our content, uh, it's a good way to do that is going to YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash UA Museums. You can just subscribe to the YouTube channel and you'll get notified anytime that we go live like we did this morning. Or if you want to check out any of our past uh, video live streams or uh, pre-recorded content. You can check out all of that there. Uh, and since it is Moundville Monday, we also have a Moundville email newsletter. So if you want to go to moundville.museums.ua.edu, click on the email newsletter button. Um, that'll get you signed up so that you can follow what Moundville is doing. All right. Well, thank you again, Stacy, for joining us this morning and talking about the Alabama Historical Commission and what you do as the state archaeologist and a little bit about archaeology and history. So we really appreciate you coming on and sharing that with Thanks. us this morning. 
All right. Well, and thank you to everybody who was watching with us live and to everybody who will watch this later because we know that you guys do that. Uh, mm -hmm. So thank you for visiting UA Museums from your home. Happy Malvo Monday, everybody. Bye, everybody.